Welcome to Biomechanics Lab. In this video, we're going to cover the basics of the shoulder girdle. Now, if you're looking in your textbook for lab with respect to this chapter, um, I think you're going to find there's a lot of um, details and um, kind of really specific things, and I think it's really easy to get lost in the weeds. So hopefully with this, we'll simplify some of the uh, more important things that you really need to know. Now, the question is, what is the shoulder girdle? Um, and how do we compare that to the shoulder joint um, that we're going to talk about actually in the next chapter, which is also going to be uploaded to Canvas um, for you to watch. The shoulder joint is going to be more associated with much larger movements. Okay, So we're going to be talking there about, say, um, flexion of the shoulder, um, extension, total abductions and adductions. When we're talking about the shoulder girdle itself, the shoulder is not just one joint, okay? It's a complex arrangement of muscles, bones, tendons, and ligaments, and the function of the shoulder girdle itself is going to be to provide strength to the shoulder, it's going to increase the range of motion of the shoulder, and then also, particularly for the actual shoulder joint, it's going to provide some stabilization. Um, what we're going to find is there's really only one primary attachment between the humerus, which is the upper, or I should really say the proximal bone of your, of your arm. There's only one connection between that and the, um, and the axial skeleton. Okay, And so because of that, we need some extra stabilization there. In fact, um, pretty much all of the movements of the upper extremity are going to depend on a fully functioning shoulder girdle. And actually what we can see is in certain sports such as baseball, we can have injuries to the shoulder girdle, particularly in anything where we're having a ton of overhand kind of throwing movements, such as pitchers in baseball, volleyball players can have the same thing. And whenever the shoulder girdle becomes compromised, then other systems, particularly in the upper body, also become compromised. All right, let's take a look at the bones here. All right, so right here, this is in the area of the center of your chest, um, and this is going to be looking at the anterior view. This is the manubrium, and if we go inferior to that, this was going to be the sternum, which we know is going to extend farther down. This area right here is not actually technically part of the shoulder girdle, um, but it does connect to the bones of the shoulder girdle, which are going to be the clavicle and this flat bone called the scapula. Okay. One of the important things is going to be to recognize this called the glenoid cavity or the glenoid fossa. And the glenoid fossa is going to be the primary insertion point for the head of the humerus. Okay. And so when we're talking about, say, the humerus, um, that's the proximal bone of our arms. And that's going to be involved in adduction, abduction, flexion, extension, because we're going to have to be moving our entire arm for those motions to occur. And if we only have this insertion point, we're going to have to have some stabilization, and we're going to have to have the shoulder girdle perform all those functions I mentioned, increase range of motion, and provide some strength and stability for that. Okay, so here's the bones. Um, this is going to be a posterior view. Okay, you can see this is the posterior surface of the scapula, and this is going to be the glenoid cavity right here. Okay, those are some of the main things we're going to concern ourselves with right now. Let's take a quick look at some of the muscles, and I'm not going to go into the detail of the muscles right here. We're going to save that for a few slides. So let's, let's look at some of the primary muscles of the shoulder girdle, and they're not necessarily necessarily really close to the shoulder. You can see down here this muscle called the serratus anterior actually is a little more inferior. It's actually on level with some of the rectus abdominis muscles. But nevertheless, it's a longer muscle and it is a part of the shoulder girdle. And by the way, this is an anterior view. Here we have the subclavius right here, which is basically right beneath the clavicles. And then we also have the pectoralis minor. Okay. If we look at the posterior side near the neck, um, we have the trapezius muscle, a pretty large muscle. We have the levator scapulae. We have the rhomboids, which consist of the rhomboidius minor, and then also the rhomboidius major. Also notice the rhomboidius major is the inferior part of the rhomboids, whereas the minor part is the superior part. Okay, And again, we'll look at more detail of that in a minute. 
We may even come back to these slides for some reference. And these are the serratus anterior muscles. This is going to be looking at the person from their right side. We already looked at those. This is from the anterior side, the serratus anterior muscles. Okay, so one of the things we're really concerned with, particularly in this chapter, is we want to understand the motions that we can do with the shoulder girdle that do not necessarily involve the shoulder joint where we have the much larger movements like abduction, adduction, flexion, and extension. Okay, So we'll look at these muscles and hopefully learn to understand which muscles play a role as agonists in those particular motions. Now, one of the things I want to make perfectly clear, when we're only talking about the shoulder girdle, we have abduction and adduction. These motions, as you, and you can see the motions right here, are very different than when we're talking about abduction and adduction of the shoulder joint. For example, if I'm doing an abduction of the shoulder joint, I start out with my arm by my side, and pretty much keeping my arm straight, I just move it away from my midline in the frontal plane. Okay, so if this person's arm was right here and their hand was right here, they're going to rotate it up like this all the way out. And then adduction would be moving it back towards the midline. You can see that for the shoulder girdle purposes, these ab this abduction and adduction are very different. Okay, um, We know that abduction is moving away from the midline. Really what the shoulder girdle is technically doing is you're looking, you're kind of thinking about it as movement of the scapula. You have to remember where the scapula is. And so by doing a motion like this where you kind of move your arm kind of in front of your chest, which is what this abduction is, the scapula is moving away from the midline. So what they're showing here is that. The scapula is moving away from the midline. And since it's moving away, that's going to be an abduction, and it's, it's also occurring in the frontal plane, which is a characteristic of that motion. The adduction of the shoulder girdle would be if you sort of took your arm and moved it back behind the plane of your back. Um, one way you can kind of think about this, something that might involve this, if you kind of do it really slowly, if you imagine elbowing somebody from behind, that would be an adduction of the shoulder girdle. And particularly with the scapula, you can see that when you do this motion, it's moving toward the midline in the frontal plane. That's a characteristic of adduction. All right, All right. so elevation and depression. Um, these are a little more, um, I guess you could say, intuitive, at least to me. Um, for these two, C and D, you need to think more or less about, the sh about shrugs. So if you go to the gym and do shrugs, you're doing elevation and depression of the shoulder girdle, particularly of the scapula. So when you do this elevation going up, you can see that the scapula is moving up. Notice that pretty much for the most part, your whole arm is really not moving much. Okay, um, And understand that these motions can be coupled with complex motions of the shoulder joint. But for the most part, we're just talking about movement of the scapula. And if you move it up, it's elevation. If you move it down, that would be the downward phase of the, of the shrug. That's a depression, and you're depressing the scapula. So elevation scapula moves in the superior direction. Depression, it moves inferiorly. And then we have upward rotation and downward rotation. So these are actually angular motions of the scapula. If we're looking at abduction, adduction, elevation, and depression of the scapula, the scapula is basically just translating in one direction, whether it's left or right or up and down. Those are linear motions. If we're looking at these two, E and F, these are rotational motions. So when we do motions like this, upward rotation, and then move it back down to our side, downward rotation, the scapula is actually rotating. Um, whether it's this way or back down. And because it's rotating, these are not linear motions, these are angular motions of the scapula. Okay, so hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. All right, this is kind of a nice little figure. I kind of like this. Um, very, very useful. Um, you might want to find this figure in your book. This is basically showing, particularly with the scapula, which muscles play a role as agonists in various motions. So for example, if we're talking about abduction. So abduction, remember, was when we kind of moved our arm in front of our chest, as shown here. The scapula is actually moving away from the midline, and that would be done using the serratus anterior muscles and the pectoralis minor. Whereas if we're doing adduction, moving it back to the midline, like this motion right here, 
Then the agonists are now the rhomboids and the middle and lower trapezius. Okay. Um, now one thing is, remember, we have antagonistic movements. The abduction is the antagonist movement to the adduction. Likewise, the elevation is an antagonist movement to the depression. It basically just means both of those movements move in the opposite direction. Okay? Same thing with upward rotation and downward rotation. So, for example, if we were looking at abduction versus adduction, we have one set of muscles that abducts, serratus anterior and pectoralis minor, and another set of muscles that adducts, the rhomboids and the middle and lower trapezius. These sets of muscles would therefore be antagonists to each other. Okay? And the same thing goes with, say, elevation versus depression. Elevation is done by rhomboids and the upper and middle trapezius and the levator scapulae, whereas depression of the scapula is done through the lower trapezius and the pectoralis minor. Therefore, these muscles would be antagonistic to these up here. And you can make the same arguments for the rotational mov movements of the scapula. All right, so this right here, this is just a table, and we've got, it continues on the next slide. Um, and this is basically just looking at, now instead of looking at the motions, now we're looking at individual muscles. And it tells you basically what movements are, do these muscles basically catalyze, or however you want to say it. So for example, um, the anterior muscle, the pectoralis minor, is going to be worried about abduction, downward rotation, and depression. Well, let's look back at this slide and see if it matches that. So we're looking at the pectoralis minor. So pectoralis minor is involved in abduction. That's what we see right here. It should also be involved in downward rotation and depression. Depression, we see it there, and downward rotation, we see it here. Um, in some ways, I like this figure better. I like it with respect to the movement, not the muscle. But if you feel more comfortable looking at these, you can certainly look at this. One thing I do like about this table is it does tell you kind of the relative locations of these muscles in the shoulder girdle. For example, pectoralis minor is anterior. The serratus anterior is both on the posterior and the lateral sides. Remember, we can see the serratus anterior, serratus anterior on the lateral side, but then it kind of extends towards the posterior side. Um, it continues on this, and you can see that most of these muscles are actually posterior muscles. And that makes sense because the scapula, if we look at the scapula, the scapula is more on the posterior side. So it would make sense that most of the muscles are on the posterior side. And the ones on the posterior side are going to be pretty much all the trapezius muscles, upper fibers, middle fibers, lower fibers. You can hopefully see that the trapezius is a very large muscle. That's why it's divided into several regions. And each of those regions pretty much does a different thing or different sets of things. And then the other posterior ones are the rhomboids and the levator scapulae. Okay? And you can see in this figure that um, it tells you which sets of spinal nerves innervate those particular muscles. Um, we are not going to go over that. Um, you're welcome to learn that if it interests you. Um, the main things we want to really concern ourselves with the shoulder girdle is understanding what its purpose is, which remember, the shoulder girdle's purpose, as I mentioned on the title slide, is pretty much to provide stability for um, a bunch of other joints in the upper extremity, particularly of the sh actual shoulder joint, so for gross movements of the entire arm. It provides range of motion for that for those joints, so same thing for the shoulder joint, and then it also provides added strength. Okay, and then also remember with the shoulder girdle, we're not looking at really complex, enormous movements of the entire arm. We're pretty much just looking at movements of the scapula. But remember, these movements can be coupled with gross movements of the entire arm, which would be characteristic of the shoulder joint. And that's what we're actually going to cover in the next video. So go ahead and watch that. We'll have a quiz over this and that chapter um, when you come to class next week.